How's that? Oh, I'm doing quite well. Quite well. Thank you. How's my audio now? My audio level? Okay. How was it? Better now. Uh, well, Guatemala, actually. Oh, it's a beautiful day here. Uh, the weather always seems to be beautiful. <laughs> I don't know if you can tell from my uh, my webcam, but I am uh, extremely sunburned at the moment. <laughs> it's beautiful. Yes. <laughs> well, I've been uh, teaching internationally uh, since 2002. I started teaching in the United States um, after I got laid off in the, the corporate world. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting story. I'll, I'll have to save it for later. But uh, started teaching and then uh, I started meeting people who were sponsoring different international teacher exchange programs. And so I got a job in South Korea, uh, taught there for oh seven years. And since then, I've lived in Georgia, China. Uh, the last school was in Mexico, Mexico City. And now I am in Guatemala. Uh, as of next week, I'll be a technology integration coach for the American School of Guatemala. All right, well, I'll, I'll tell you the story. I'll try to keep it brief. I was a computer consultant in the corporate world when the tech bubble burst in 2001, uh, and along with a lot of other people, of course. And then um, almost immediately, I got a job teaching at a college, uh, the University of Denver, teaching uh, graduate school software engineering courses. I realized I had uh, missed my true calling in life and switched careers to education, and so I've been teaching ever since. Okay, well, uh, well, excellent. Uh, hola, uh, my name is David Deeds. As I mentioned, as of next week, I'll be a technology integration coach for the American School of Guatemala. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you uh, here today, even virtually. And I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Nelly Deutsch and her associates for putting on, uh, once again, a, a great virtual conference. Uh, it's indeed an honor to be part of the uh, Moodle Moot Virtual Conference 2014. So to get started here, as I mentioned, I am in Guatemala. Right now I am a student at the Ichel School in Antigua, Guatemala. I am studying my Spanish uh, because my Spanish right now is muy malo. It's very bad. So I am trying to improve my Spanish uh, before I go. Antigua is a beautiful historic place. There are lots of wonderful things about Guatemala or about uh, Antigua in particular. Uh, unfortunately, internet access isn't necessarily one of them, so I have to warn you that my internet will probably cut out at least once. Uh, I saw a uh, 
I saw a message here. Didn't Mexico help? Yes, my survival Spanish is uh, is quite good, uh, but I need to take it up a notch if I'm going to communicate uh, with the teachers in uh, Guatemala City. My job is going to be training teachers there, and not everyone there is uh, fluent in English. So let's go ahead and get started here. Teaching and Training with 3D Virtual Worlds is the title of the presentation. Uh, my goal today is not to commit death by PowerPoint. I'm going to pause for questions and comments. Uh, please interrupt me and let's have a discussion versus a lecture. Uh, I've given this type of presentation many times. As I'll mention in just a moment, I want to talk a little bit more about training teachers uh, versus uh, just uh, teaching students. I'll first do some introductions about 3D virtual worlds. And I have me here on the slide. I think we've already covered that. Um, I'm assuming that most of you have some kind of knowledge as to uh, what I'm talking about, but we'll go through some basics just in case. And as always, I'd like to cover best practices and the lessons learned in a uh, what works, what doesn't work format. That seems to work quite well for most people. I see we've got some folks here from Nigeria. I assume my audio level is OK. And everything else, oh, no knowledge whatsoever. All right, well, I'll try to, uh, to, to cover some basics then. We have folks from Italy. Welcome, welcome. All right, great. Uh, oh, and of course, along the way, I'll be comparing and contrasting uh, higher ed versus K-12, uh, student teaching versus teacher training. And so can life is uh, open simulator. Desperate to learn. I like. I have, uh, I have some sources that you can uh, that you can access uh, a little bit later that will give you more uh, background information. I posted the slides in case you want to have the slides. I, I know Nelly always records these sessions, so you'll be able to uh, to access the recording later. And. Uh, your handsome look. Well, thank you very much. An A plus for you. You know how to be pointed out already. Uh, because of the weather here, the beautiful weather, uh, I do have quite a, uh, a sunburn at the moment. I'm usually not quite this red. Uh, can you stop your webcam? The connection is getting challenging. Okay. Yes, I can. There. Now you'll just have to. Do have to uh, bear with not being able to see my, uh, my beautiful face. All right, let's get going. Now, I realized as I was putting this presentation together that I have thousands now of photos and screen captures of uh, students uh, using worlds and, of course, uh, screen captures taken inside virtual worlds. So I've tried to plug some of these in today. I'll use those um, as pause points, I think. Uh, just in case anyone wants to ask any questions. Uh, yes, those are Max. This is from the school in Mexico, and every student, every high school student, had a MacBook. So uh, we were quite advanced in, uh, in that area with our one-to-one -one program. All right, so let's start. Aren't they expensive? Uh, well, yes, but um, the school in Mexico had a, um, a program where the school would subsidize the cost. Uh, this was a private school, so uh, compared to the average Mexican student, our, uh, our learners were quite well off, and so it wasn't really that much of a burden uh, for these families to afford MacBooks, fortunately. So a 3D virtual world. I have a definition for you newbies, or you noobs as we call you. Uh, a computer-based online community that is designed and built by individuals so they can interact, share, etc. And I, uh, I stole that, or borrowed it, <laughs> rather, from the Techopedia website. The, the key words for me here are designed and built. Um, Minecraft is, a, is an example of a, a program that I've had quite a bit of success with, because students can design and build inside it. Um, however, I consider that in the game category, as opposed to a, a, a virtual world. A virtual world, for me, is one where you start off with nothing and you design it from the ground up. And you also have a lot of uh, interaction, talking, texting, 
that you wouldn't have in a, a game such as Minecraft, for example. However, 3D virtual worlds have all of the advantages of games-based learning, plus a whole lot more. Uh, games-based learning is a, a big buzzword or buzz term in education lately, uh, and it's, it's wonderful. I love it, too. I consider virtual worlds to be kind of like games, but like game on steroids. <laughs> and I'll, you'll see why, I hope, as we progress here. Um, virtual learning environment or immersive learning environments are the, the newer terms. You also see people calling them massively multiplayer online, optionally role-playing game, etc. There are lots of them out there. Uh, World of Warcraft, Quest Atlantis are examples of games that are already built. Quest Atlantis is a wonderful, wonderful educational tool. I've already mentioned Minecraft. Today I'm talking about Second Life and Open Simulator. And as I mentioned before, uh, I want to talk more about teacher training today. Uh, when I give these presentations, I tend to uh, obsess <laughs> with, with teaching students because that's, of course, what, what we're really doing. But these tools are great for training teachers as well. All right, as I mentioned, I'm, uh, I tried to use some of the screen captures, this uh, abundance plethora of screen captures that I have. Here's an example. This is the Virtual Worlds Education Roundtable. Once you get into Second Life, you can uh, take advantage of these are folks who meet on a regular basis, monthly, I believe. And these, of course, are all teachers in the audience. And I gave a presentation to them last year. I'm seeing someone say no sound. Can everyone else hear me? Hello, can everyone else hear me? Hmm, OK. Some people say yes. Only one person says no. OK, great. Uh, here's a screen capture from our Open Simulator campus that we had at the uh, the last school. And of course, I've got lots of shots of students in here as well. Uh, the reason I, I like to always include uh, pictures of students when I can is that I have found, I've been teaching, as I mentioned, 13 years, some of you have already heard, nothing, nothing else gets students engaged in the learning experience quite like 3D virtual worlds. Uh, Minecraft, I had a lot of success with it, but still, Minecraft has a, a shelf life, as I, I put it. Usually, about after a semester, students are ready to move on. Uh, with Open Simulator and Second Life, it never gets old. Here's a photograph, or a screen capture, I should say, of our uh, of our uh, cyber campus at Peterson Schools. Um, the Athens Academy students and teachers welcome that you see there. Uh, means that this was taken during a project that we were doing with a school in the United States called the National Association of Independent Schools 2020 project. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. All right, so let's start with Second Life. Uh, people call it lots of things. Uh, massively multiplayer online role playing. It was introduced by Linden Labs in 2003. It has its own currency, its own economy. You have the intellectual property rights to everything you create. It has built-in computer-aided design and a language. It is, in fact, by itself an integrated development environment. And it's been open to people 16 and up since 2010. Uh, many people who have used Second Life in the past are also aware that this is when Second Life uh, eliminated the discount for educational institutions. Uh, they have since reinstated that. Uh, people have been writing the epitaph uh, for Second Life for years now. I still don't believe it's going away. Linden Labs, the, the company that made it, is now creating its successor called High Fidelity. So Second Life might go away. Uh, we're, we're definitely going to have it for a few more years. It'll be supported. Um, but it really doesn't matter because I believe Open Simulator is going to take over for uh, Second Life, at least eventually. Now we get to Open Simulator, and here's a screen capture of one of our projects from uh, from last year, last school year. Once again, it's a massively multiplayer online, insert your favorite description here. It was introduced in 2007, however, it's not a Second Life clone. If you ever come into contact with anyone involved with Open Sim or Open Simulator, uh, please don't call it Second Life. <laughs> They'll be insulted. It's, it's still not quite there yet. I think it's at version 0 0.8 now. Uh, so the, the common currency, the economy, intellectual property rights, uh, they're, they're coming soon. 
Oh, there's the, the main page. Thank you, Nelly. Um, it has all of the advantages, though. It has the built-in CAD, the language, the IDE. It's open to kids of all ages. And so if you have an internet connection, uh, a reliable internet connection at your school, I would suggest using a host company. Uh, however, you can get it for free as well and install it. In China, I had to do that uh, simply because our internet connection wasn't very reliable. You have a lot more control over what happens in Second Life. Um, I mean, uh, what happens in Open Simulator versus Second Life. Uh, Second Life is wonderful in many ways because it's public, but however, a lot of people are leery of it, especially in schools because it is public as well. With Open Simulator, you have the best of both uh, virtual worlds <laughs> because you can control who comes in and who gets out, but then you also have the advantage of hypergridding uh, to other locations so that you can interact with other people. Okay, I've been talking about me probably already a little bit too much. Um, Kitely, I have a, a Kitely account now. At the last school, we were using Dreamland Metaverse. And uh, I also have a campus um, available to me with Vibe, uh, Virtual Islands for Better Education. And I'll be mentioning uh, that again soon. So I've been using these since 2006, three years in higher ed, uh, five in K-12 international schools. So that's at one university, one college, and uh, the American School of Guatemala will be my fourth school that I'll be using it with K-12. Once again, some shots of student work here. All right, so let's get right into it. Higher ed, second life, student teaching. You can see me there wearing my Shingu College in Songnam, South Korea uh, t-shirt. Who were we teaching? Uh, because of class sizes and because I was involved with lots of other classes, uh, I've taken over 500 students now in World to Second Life. Uh, my students were freshmen to juniors. We were teaching them computer programming, business management. Um, when I introduced this to the university uh, in South Korea, one of the first things that people recognize, my associates, my colleagues recognize, is that this is great for language learning. And in fact, uh, my fellow teachers were using it for teaching English much more than I ever did <laughs> when it came to uh, programming or uh, business management. But the, it all came about, it's actually a, a long story. I can give a, a presentation on this uh, by itself. The reason I had to do it was because my students could not speak English. I was supposed to be teaching them in English and they simply weren't proficient enough to be able to do it. And so I switched to 3D virtual worlds. That was the reason behind adopting them in the first place. Uh, what were we doing? We were teaching without textbooks uh, because the kids couldn't read textbooks. But they created and managed their own cyber campus. They put on shows. Uh, we were interacting with students all over the world. Uh, they handled all the management and pricing and marketing for their business. Uh, for example, we had a t-shirt shop uh, with uh, Zazzle. They were designing their own t-shirts for sale in the real world. And every design was also put on a t-shirt in Second Life as well. Um, it's an active process. That's perhaps the most important thing about it. Learner-centric. And of course, we had an English curriculum um, that we were managing to uh, implement simply because they were using virtual worlds. And it wasn't that much of a problem that their English wasn't that great. As I mentioned, we hosted and visited students in other countries to practice English. Virtual field trips is a big thing. So what worked? Well, we bridged the communications gap. That was a, that was a big goal, major goal when it came to Korea. It was an even bigger one in China. I'll get to that one in a moment once I started teaching in K-12 schools. Uh, we overcame the antisocial social media behavior, <laughs> yeah, which is uh, an acronym that uh, only I like, ASMEB. Uh, I made it up. It's, uh, it's quite witty. Thank you very much. Uh, it basically means that now suddenly, instead of Facebook, uh, instead of other uh, social media mechanisms or tools, when you're, you're anonymous, you're anonymous in these virtual worlds, but yet you also have a presence there. And so uh, it's great for teaching digital citizenship. We hit the sweet spot regarding programming payoff. If you've tried to teach uh, programming to kids, 
um, even college kids, you know that you can't uh, just cover uh, object-oriented uh, uh, orientation for six months without kids being able to see what their code is actually going to do. And with Linden's scripting language, which is the, the programming language that's part of these tools, they get to immediately make their objects interactive. Um, again, because of the language, we were using the sheltered instruction observation protocol, which uh, started in the States for uh, teaching uh, immigrant children uh, to create individualized lesson plans. Uh, of course, we were able to differentiate and include everybody, and I'll touch on those points a little bit later. What didn't work well, trying to recreate the classroom configuration or situation of virtual world, one mistake that a lot of people make uh, is that they'll go into Second Life or Open Simulator and they'll create a classroom and expect kids to sit at a desk. <laughs> and, and listen, it, it works with teachers, it works with adults, but it doesn't work with kids. Kids want to get around and explore. One of the things with Second Life, as I mentioned before, is that, uh, yes, it is open. However, you can't really sit around worrying about people meeting weirdos. I've been doing this for eight years now. Nothing bad has ever happened. There are a lot of nervous folks out there who will say, oh, well, what if kids actually meet adults? Well, meeting adults is kind of the point. <laughs> they might be attending a, a lecture from a college professor. Um, so anyway, you don't need to worry about that. And at Open Simulator, of course, you have complete control over who they meet. So it's no big deal. Um, what's this? They scared me and I'm not a kid. We, every once in a while, you would meet some folks uh, who were, were questionable. And I, I won't take up too much time with this, but I'll, I'll tell you a little story. I was in China. Some kids were in, on their Second Life cyber campus. And these two avatars showed up, the a male and a female. The guy looked like a, a village people uh, cowboy reject. The woman had on this uh, head-to-toe... Uh, latex, like S&M outfit, and the kids looked at me and said, Mr. David, these guys look weird. What should we do? And I said, well, just say hello and find out who they are. It turns out that they were Princeton professors doing research on Second Life, so, so don't worry about who they're going to meet. Uh, don't make your assignments too open-ended, especially as the kids get younger. Uh, Yes, make them skeleton plans, make them uh, open to interpretation, but you can't just bring kids into a second life or open simulator and just have them do whatever they want to. They've got to be able to have some kind of goal. Uh, we did not have much luck trying to mix English with other subjects, and of course we, uh, we always had a, a, a pep talk. We never just jumped right in. I, was, I would always have to have them take their fingers off the keyboards uh, for a few minutes and explain what it is we're trying to do. Now, as I promised, I want to talk a little bit about teacher training. You see the screen capture here is a, uh, is a session of the nonprofit commons. Uh, this was a session, as I recall, about using virtual worlds for uh, training people with uh, disabilities, helping people with disabilities. This is a classic example of how your teachers can go into a second world and get professional development, a virtual world, and get professional development that they otherwise would not have access to for free. So who were we trained to hire at? Well, we had foreign professors in Korea. Most of them were teaching English. Uh, we had Korean professors who were teaching English, but also math and computer science. I, of course, was in the computer science department. Uh, Mainly, what we were trying to do was provide Second Life training so that teachers could use them in their own classes. And we had quite a bit of success with this. We had people teaching math, uh, computer science. As I mentioned before, language learning is the big one. It always turns out to be the big one uh, in higher ed. Uh, professional development, otherwise not possible due to geography and languages. So what worked? Well, we would make sure that everyone understood Second Life basics. Uh, we would have a Second Life boot camp, as I called it. And then once they understood what to do and how to maneuver around and to find their own uh, training, their own uh, opportunities, usually we would just let them go. 
uh, people tended to um, look for opportunities in their own language, of course. Uh, we were not the first university to have a cyber campus in Korea. Uh, most notably, the uh, Korean National University of Education had one. And so the, the Korean professors, for example, would go and find them, and they would set up their own uh, professional development opportunities. Uh, but then again, lots of people used it for teaching and learning. We had people teaching Korean uh, to English speakers and English speakers to uh, uh, teaching Korean, uh, teaching English to Koreans. Uh, what didn't work, trying to tie in Second Life professional development with formal programs, it just never worked. Well, I see uh, someone asking about Sloodle. Uh, Sloodle was a, a mix between Second Life and Moodle, and uh, it worked uh, quite well. I'm not sure. I've kind of lost track of it. I was one of the early testers for that. Um, it'd be interesting trying to find out what... Uh, what happened to that, whether or not people are still working on that. What it allowed you to do was have a 2D course uh, in the real world and then tie in the objects with a, uh, a Second Life Cyber Campus so that you could actually submit uh, objects and assignments back and forth. Agile Bill Krebs, I, I think I know you. Yeah, I was one of the, uh, one of the first guys, in fact. In fact, I had a, a little piece of land on uh, Sloodle Island. I don't even know if that's... Uh, still there or, uh, or not. Maybe we'll have to talk a little bit about that. Maybe you can catch us up as to what's going on. Okay, so I'm going to pause for a moment before I get into student teaching. Oh, here we go. Fire, fire Centaur, that's right. Sloodle is still around, okay. So is it, um, where is it now? Uh, version, it must have hit version one by now. Paul is in Korea, okay. Oh yeah, I know Paul Prebish. It's been a while since he and I have talked. Now I'm going to scroll back a little bit through here in the, the chat and see. Is there anything that anyone has any, uh, any questions about? We're talking about Sloodle, anything else? All right, well, let's keep going. So K-12, as of 2009, um, I kind of realized, as uh, I think many college professors do, that uh, I was never going to get beyond uh, simply being assigned uh, existing courses. <laughs> I was tired of that. I wanted to actually get control over the curriculum. And so I switched to international schools, K-12 international schools. Um, couldn't use Second Life at first. Uh, we had to switch to Open Simulator, and then as I mentioned in 2010, we were able to use Second Life for, uh, for high school students. Let's get into that. So who were we teaching? Well, um, one of the blessings of being at an international baccalaureate school is that your classes are small. <laughs> so uh, over the years, I've only taken like 50 students total in world. Uh, the main reason for using Second Life was to provide a setting for the information technology in a global society class, uh, which is in group three in international baccalaureate terms, individuals and societies. It's a fascinating class to, uh, to teach, and I hope my students have found it a, uh, a fascinating class to take. Basically, it's a humanities class with technology as a focus, one of the focuses. And so we had a, a, a Diploma program is what high school is called in an IB school. We first started using it uh, as an alternative for kids with low English school, uh, skills, uh, kind of the same thing that we did in, uh, in higher ed. We had uh, kids in China, for example, whose English weren't that, uh, wasn't that great, and it, it just something that we had to do, an alternative for them to be able to take classes. Uh, one of the things that I uh, took great pride in is that uh, when we started accepting Chinese kids at the school in uh, Changchun, they couldn't take the regular classes like geography and physics and everything else in English. We had to take them out of every class except for physical education and my classes because my classes were not based on, on languages. We could switch the viewers that you use in order to interact with the, uh, the virtual worlds to their languages, and we had a variety of languages, um, and they were ready to go. 
So what were we doing? Well, once again, they maintain a cyber campus. They would host students from other schools and other countries. I mentioned the, uh, the Challenge 2020 project before. This was a project uh, that we did in Mexico. We were partnered with the school in the United States. They were assigned a problem, a global problem. In our case, it was global warming. They used our cyber campus as a place to meet, and they also uh, designed solutions, some of them real, <laughs> some of them uh, unreal or virtual, I guess you should say. Uh, people can use their imagination in a virtual world. They had designed all of these different solutions. They were able to build them, uh, use the programming language to make them function, and so suddenly you had like a, a desalination plant and uh, things to, uh, to solve all the problems of uh, global learning. At global warming. Uh, once again, we use some e-textbooks. The uh, the kids in Mexico uh, are a lot better in uh, English than the books that I had in uh, in China, and so we had textbooks provided for uh, context uh, to study the ethical and moral uh, aspects of different kinds of uh, implementations of technology. Uh, we had projects, we had products. Uh, one of the most interesting things that we did was arrange for cyber visits. So the kids graduating from high school could actually go to the cyber campus of their college in Second Life and talk to professors and students there. Um, and of course, we also had to prepare for the, the written exam, uh, ITGS, Information Technology in a Global Society, uh, involves a written exam. And we used Second Life, the libraries within Second Life, for their research. Oh, and for interviews, too. They also set up interviews with people. So what worked, as I've mentioned, using the viewers in the native languages and making all assignments language neutral. Uh, perhaps one of the most important things is that virtual worlds allow for a hands-on visual aspect of just about all work. They have the opportunity to experiment, to meet other people. And again, there's a sense of freedom and openness uh, but again, I caution you, especially if you're teaching in K-12, <laughs> that you don't leave it too open. You have to have some kind of uh, some kind of goal, some kind of objective, and also some kind of rubric uh, for assessing them, which I'll mention a little bit later. What didn't work? Well, the same lessons as with higher ed. Can't recreate a classroom experience. Kids just won't sit still. Um, assuming that students didn't need prep for project-based learning, uh, this was a big mistake. Uh, students need, especially at K-12, uh, especially as they're younger, they need to be able to know how to manage their time and manage their efforts. Otherwise, what happens is that if you're not in their face every minute of an hour class, they think it's playtime. Uh, we tried to get students to train teachers. Uh, that didn't quite work. There's still hope. I hope, hope at the next school that that would work. And of course, uh, the, the biggest thing that doesn't work with the virtual worlds is pretending that it's not fun. It is just don't uh, don't tell your parents, as I used to tell them. All right, let's get to Second Life for teacher training. Here's a screen capture uh, from the Second Life MOOC, again put on by Nellie Deutsch and uh, her associates. Uh, another example of being able to get teachers from all around the world into Second Life and to learn from each other. So who were we training? Well, in the K-12 world, we were teaching computer science teachers and other teachers at IB schools in China and Mexico so far. Administrators to a limited extent. Uh, we had some administrators who were interested simply because of the professional development opportunities and the fact that they were free. <laughs> as soon as you tell an administrator that something is free, then they get excited. And we actually had some administrators trained to the point where they were able to take teachers in and show them, OK, do a search if you want to learn about programming, if you want to learn about this, if you want to learn about that. So what were we doing? Well, we were providing PD possibilities, otherwise not available, due to budget and to language barriers. Uh, in Changchung, China, for example, we were very isolated. Uh, it's not like you could go down the street and find training in English. Uh, it turned out that Second Life was one of the few opportunities that people had without actually hopping on a plane uh, to, to get professional training from other teachers. They could do Skype and other things, other online possibilities. But Second Life turned to be the most valuable. 
Uh, we were training teachers how to use Second Life, of course, and also 3D Virtual Worlds, Minecraft, Quest Atlantis. Um, I would start teachers off in Second Life um, as their boot camp, as I've mentioned before, for using other virtual worlds. Once they learned how to maneuver and navigate and use Second Life, they were able to, first of all, understand the purpose of Minecraft and Quest Atlantis and other virtual worlds, but also they were able to use the controls. So what worked? Well, especially in China, as I've mentioned, teachers enjoyed the free PD, but they also formed lasting relationships with people. Uh, I did the same. Uh, we did uh, a little experiment with ITGS where we had teachers from uh, around China all teaching ITGS together. Unfortunately, as you see down at the bottom, it usually didn't evolve past a novelty status. Uh, I thought we were going to be teaching ITGS together with these other schools in China. Uh, the folks did it for a couple of weeks, and then it's like, okay, that's great, but now we have to prepare for <laughs> that written exam. Uh, in Mexico, the guest tours seem to work best. Uh, an example is uh, Max Chatnor, who puts together the or manages the Genome Island in Second Life, gave a tour to a biology class. Our biology teacher fell in love with Second Life. Uh, he wrote an article for the school magazine. Uh, he still talks about that. Uh, it's, it's one of the things that you can do to sell Second Life at your school or virtual worlds in general is to get someone to take your students on a tour. It really works. Um, success varied by subject. Uh, art, people get it right away. You can have art shows uh, where students uh, display their, their artwork inside. Of course, they can create their own art inside Second Life, their own sculptures. Um, English teachers loved it as well. Science teachers, as I mentioned. Um, others, I just never could get them uh, into it, um, ironically enough, uh, because of math, uh, because everything in a virtual world like Second Life or Open Simulator is 3D. You have the ability to uh, uh, teach math quite easily and in a very fun way. Uh, people in higher ed got it. Uh, the folks in K-12 never quite got it. Okay, I'm going to pause here for a moment for some questions, but uh, I noticed uh, some sources over here. That's great. If you really have to have one book, just one, in order to sell your administrators or teachers who aren't quite convinced, this is the book I recommend. It's only for higher ed uh, as far as the title is concerned, but it applies to all education, all levels of education. It's a brief book. That's what people like about it. You can give your uh, high school principal or uh, someone else, some other administrator at your school, this book, and they, they won't groan. <laughs> some, of the, some of the tomes out there on virtual worlds are like 500 pages long, and they're just not going to read it. Try this book and see if it makes a difference. Now, if you're interested in getting your own Second Life Cyber Campus, I personally recommend that you call the New Media Consortium. These are the folks that put out the Horizon Report. In fact, uh, I was on the advisory board again uh, this year for the report. The K-12 edition is, has just come out this past summer. Anyway, they are in the position of being able to offer you discounts. You also have the advantage of being on a sim or a region that is inhabited completely by schools. So it also cuts down on some of the, uh, the unwanted traffic. And you also have access to mutual facilities that you get to enjoy for no extra cost. All right, now you see what happens. I, I start talking and I just start babbling away. Are there any questions at this point? I'll pause. I keep promising to pause. And now I'm going to pause. Does anyone have any questions? I noticed some discussion going on over in the chat area. Does anyone have any questions?
Um, okay, well, very good questions. Uh, do we actually have proof that it works? Boy, I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, I can, I can provide lots of anecdotal evidence. Um, I know that there has to be research out there that proves um, that these virtual worlds are great for language teaching and learning. Off the top of my head, uh, I don't know. But I can tell you that um, I'm going to, I've got a slide later in the presentation. Uh, three years ago, I wrote a book. It's about Open Simulator, but I mentioned uh, Second Life as well. And in the back of that book is a list, pages and pages long, of different resources. I don't know if there's anything specifically uh, about languages, but that's uh, that's certainly something that I can uh, can look up and uh, give you as a uh, give you as a resource later. It's it's always mentioned in the books um, about virtual worlds, but I don't know if anyone has. I'm I'm sure that people have gone out there and done uh, studies. There's a guy named Kip Bone who uh, uh, presented at the Second Life MOOC uh, last year. Uh, the research is there. It, it proves that it works. I can't name a resource off the top of my head. Um, now, as far as why didn't they get it, you're going to be fighting a battle here with virtual worlds if you try to implement this into your school. And I've, I've got a slide that mentions it. If you can at all, try to just do it. Just open a Second Life campus or an open simulator cyber campus and just start. Don't try to prove it in advance <laughs> because what's going to happen is, is you've got uh, administrators who are still new to, uh, uh, to like email or you know, uh, new to Moodle. All of a sudden, you start hitting them with a virtual world and an avatar flying around, and they're just not going to understand what's happening. Um, that's why the, the tour is often a, a great way. If you can say, okay, now listen, biology teacher, uh, we're going to take your students on a tour of an island with interactive exercises where people can actually uh, click on DNA strands and, and be able to, uh, to study um, biology in a, a different way. It's great. Math teachers find it a little bit hard, I have found, to understand simply because um, it doesn't have the, the book workbook model. Yes, you're building things. Yes, they have dimensions. Yes, you have to worry about angles and all this sort of thing. But it's just difficult for them to, uh, to comprehend at first. Uh, in higher ed, they got it right away. Uh, it, I think it's just the, uh, the paradigm shift, if I, if I have to use that phrase. Um, they just they have a lot of trouble doing it. And so what I'm going to do at the next school is not simply sit down with a math teacher and say, look, here's a virtual world. I'm going to actually design exercises according to whatever book or workbook he or she is using, okay, for geometry or whatever, and then show them how students can put these kind of ideas into a, at least a virtual manifestation, if not a real manifestation. Yeah, it's, it's not, uh, again, if you want to implement virtual worlds, try to find at least one cheerleader in your organization who, if they don't fully understand it, at least won't stand in your way, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, the, the best administrators I've had over the past couple of years would be like, David, I have no idea what you're talking about, but just go ahead and do it, okay? Um, don't try to get people's approval in advance. It's just not going to work. It's, it's just too much for these folks to take in until you've actually got it working, and then you have the ability to actually show them how it's, doing, how it's done. I see someone has raised their hand. That's interesting. Um, let's see. Okay, so let me pause here. I've got one question. Do you think this would work in a one-to-one -one setting? Uh, yes, that's, that's what we were doing uh, in Mexico. Everyone had a uh, had his own computer. It was not the case in China. Uh, we still had computer labs in China. But yes, in a one-to-one -one setting, it works quite well. Who's the guy who raised his hand? Yes, in fact, uh, to, uh, to answer the one-to-one uh, -one question a little bit further, you're going to find that with one-to-one, -one, when kids have their own 
uh, computers, uh, one of the problems that you're going to have, it's a nice problem to have, is that uh, students just don't want to quit. <laughs> we had, I was running a Minecraft server, for example, in Mexico, and uh, class would be over, and uh, the, the kids would ask, well, can you keep the, the server running? I'm like, well, why? Oh, well, we want to keep working. And it'll happen with Second Life and Open Simulator as well, because the, the server's always running if you're using a host company. And in fact, one of the problems you're going to have is that kids are going to be in the next class using Second Life and Open Simulator, and you're going to be in trouble with the teachers. Uh, in, in China, we had computer labs. So one class would end, the next class would start. The, the kids in the computer lab would start asking, well, Mr. David, who's this? Who's that? The kids from the previous class had gone to the library. They had figured out how to install Open Simulator on the library computers, and they were still going. So, I mean, it's it, it's literally a matter of having to drag kids away from the computers when the uh, when the classes are over, which is one of the advantages of having a computer lab. You don't have the control if they've got their own uh, they, when they've got their own uh, computers. What about being addicted, addicted to learning as a result? Uh, well, being addicted to learning is, is a great thing as far as I'm concerned. I think it's great. Uh, in Korea, for example, I'll use this example. It was higher ed. Uh, again, I had a tough time selling a lot of people on the idea. Luckily, I was in the computer science department. Uh, the department head was a great guy, and uh, he, was, he was behind me all the way. We had one of the professors who was the visual basic professor, and he'd been teaching Visual Basic for 20 years, um, couldn't understand why anyone would want to do anything else. He was very much against the idea of uh, using Second Life until he heard some kids in the hallway talking about what they were doing over the weekend in Second Life, meeting people, learning programming, this and the other thing. And uh, he asked, them, well, was this one of uh, Professor Deeds' assignments? And I said, well, no, he doesn't give us homework. We were just there because we really, really liked to do it. And that was the day that he was sold. So it, it is possible to sell people after the fact. I, I cannot overemphasize that it's difficult to sell people in advance, especially certain people. All right, any other questions at this point? I've got this timed pretty well. We'll have some, uh, we'll have some time at the end. Let's go on to Open Simulator now for uh, student teaching. Now here is where I've had lots and lots and lots of students because in China uh, I was teaching the technology classes. At, at one point I was teaching all of the technology classes from kindergarten on up. And so we used Open Simulator with everybody. Uh, you've never seen anything like a classroom full of, uh, for example, the first time they're an open simulator. I mean, they, they practically pee themselves with excitement. But you, you can see that the shift from digital, uh, digital literacy was made long ago in IB schools. It's no longer a matter of sitting down and saying, oh, here's how you use PowerPoint, here's how you use Word. And so open simulator was perfect for that because now suddenly these kids just start off with a, a blank patch of cyber grass, and it's their responsibility to design everything from the ground up. As I mentioned, we used it with primary uh, years program as well. Um, and in Mexico, we were using it mainly with a computer workshop for ninth and 10th grade. Yes, yes, we had kindergartners. Uh, we tried it with pre-K. <laughs> we were trying to, the, the school was, it's a, it was a young school. They had never had an IT teacher before. And so suddenly everyone wanted to get into the computer lab. Of course, it was great. Uh, you know, I was like the uh, uh, God's gift to education at that school, if I must say so myself. Everyone wanted to get into the computer lab. And so we even tried it with pre-K, but they, they kept falling off the chairs <laughs> in the computer lab. You, you turned around and we were like, thump, wah. So uh, we had to try something different for them. But yes, gift to education. Yes, thank you. I knew, I knew I would get in trouble if I said that. <laughs> I always think so. Uh, other people tend to disagree, but I always think so. <laughs> anyway, yes, kindergartners, um, they love it. They're, of course, what they make is, is just a big mess, but it's, it's still, they're learning how to design, they're learning how to build. We were having them run their own little projects 
Um, and of course, the whole idea of a project doesn't really tend to make sense until they get a little bit older, like three or four or fifth grade. Uh, but yes, we had kindergartners using it. Okay, another screen capture there from one of our projects uh, in Mexico. So what were we doing? Well, I was teaching computer-aided design, project management, and programming. Uh, space lessons with other tools. One of the nice things about virtual worlds is that they almost always uh, necessarily entail the use of other programs. Uh, you've got to use Photoshop to, to, uh, to fine-tune your photographs. You had people taking photographs for inclusion in virtual worlds. Uh, so we were teaching them digital photography and video uh, making as well, video editing as well. Um, so there's always a variety of other tools uh, available that you can use in order to incorporate incorporate in virtual worlds. And yes, I, I, I noticed a good point about using learning other tools. What happened is sometimes, and it's happened to me, is that if you use uh, Open Simulator, for example, for an entire uh, quarter or an entire semester, well, of course, kids are going to say, can we do it next semester, too? That's when a few eyebrows are raised and uh, the administrator is like, well, is that all you're going to do is Open Simulator? And you say, well, no, that's not all we're doing. These guys are editing, recording and editing their own sound. We had uh, people putting on concerts. Uh, they're putting together podcasts, so they were using all the audio tools for that. I mentioned all the photography. There's a wide variety of other tools that you use in order for them to upload it and put it on display or otherwise uh, share it with people in the uh, virtual worlds. Yes, we had them on concerts. We had kids. Um, we had uh, garage band in Mexico. Kids were actually writing and producing their own music. And then, of course, you can have a, a shoutcast server uh, in Open Simulator or Second Life where they can actually put on their own concerts. We invited parents to come by. Uh, we had billboards with the kid now playing, you know, such and such a kid with, uh, with his song. I had mentioned uh, skeleton lesson plans, students achieving according to their own abilities. It's also one of the best ways to differentiate your learning. In China, for example, we had kids who could not speak English at all together with native speakers in the same classroom. And it didn't matter. Um, I always tell people that, uh, that no one fails my classes. If a kid can't succeed according to a certain set of criteria, well, I just change the criteria <laughs> so that they can. Um, we had uh, kids with disabilities. We had a special needs program centered around virtual worlds. And we had our gifted program. Everyone can succeed according to his or her own abilities. Uh, other non-techie skills in the process, project management, cooperation, uh, everything from interviewing uh, to be able to um, be in charge of their own learning experience, research, amazing what you can accomplish with these tools. Uh, here's an exercise that we had in, uh, in Open Simulator in Mexico where kids were building their own uh, Olympic stadium. Interesting. All right, so what worked? I've mentioned this before. Keep your lesson plans simple, provide goals, objectives, but then let the kids decide how they're actually going to achieve that. Um, what's that? Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why I have higher education, I don't know. Maybe I'll go back one of these, one of these days. But uh, in, in K-12 schools, especially IB schools, international baccalaureate schools, you can do that. You can just say, okay, I've decided we're not going to give tests anymore in my classes. Okay, no problem. No tests. And so, so there's no more need to memorize anything. Everything is achievement-based. You've got a rubric. You grade them according to how well they did uh, on their project, how they achieved uh, surjectives. And everyone has a chance uh, because the, the kid, of course, with special needs is going to achieve to a certain level. The gifted kid is going to achieve at a completely different level, but everyone gets an A. All right, I'm getting the five-minute warning now. So let me proceed. Most of these things. I'm going to kind of skip through some of these. Once again, the slides are available online. Be a slide share. I've had like 2,000 views in a week. It's amazing. 
and of course there'll be a recording later. And you've also got uh, the ability to uh, to send me emails later, just in case you uh, you didn't get your question answered. Uh, what didn't work? Some productivity the first week. I, I mentioned the second graders running around peeing themselves. Uh, you've got to know in a K-12 environment that you just got to let kids play for like a week, uh, sometimes two weeks. Just let them experiment. They'll learn the tools themselves. They're perfectly capable of doing that uh, with some instruction and occasional help from you. Uh, never call it a game. You don't want little Susie going home and having mom and ask, well, what'd you do in school today, little Susie? And, oh, Mr. David had us playing games all day. <laughs> no, no. Tell them that you're in an immersive learning environment. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Um, you're still trying to overcome versus passive role. It's not just in Asia. Uh, you have to prepare students for their role in the classroom as well. Because otherwise, like in the traditional class, they think their job is by just showing up. They show up, they get a notebook, they get a pen, they think it's over. In my classes, they actually have to work, but they have to be prepared for that. And I mentioned trying to explain in advance, that never works. All right. Yes, I think we're running out of time here, but I've gone over all this um, varying degrees of success. Who were we training? Mostly computer science teachers, but other teachers got involved. The open later uh, community conference is coming up. The big idea was to get K-12 students and teachers involved with the projects in charge of their own learning experiences. And of course, another goal is cross-curricular classes because with virtual worlds, you can have art teachers involved, art students, math, as I mentioned, uh, science teachers. You have the ability for interdisciplinary training. All right, I better wrap this up. My book is still out there. It's three years old. A lot of the information is outdated. But if you read just chapter one and chapter three, I actually have lesson plans for Open Simulator. Okay, uh, and it, it has also some general advice that uh, that will never become outdated. Thankful. If you want to have your own Open Simulator uh, Cyber Campus, Dreamland Metaverse, Kitely, two possibilities. Uh, I mentioned Vibe. Please go and check out their website. Wonderful organization. The military is using Open Simulator training. The Open Simulator Community Conference is coming up in November. Please check that out, and please consider being a supporter. And follow my scuba page, and that's it. Any other questions? Stop, and that's why I keep telling people, oh, I'll pause and, and wait for questions, but I, I never do. <laughs> well, that's an idea. I don't know. That sounds like too much of a good thing. <laughs> oh. I've never been to Bolivia. It's one of the places I want to visit. Uh, 